It's about this. We create community, use challenge as the catalyst. The trust breeds magic. We're gonna connect on the same level. Possibility is bigger than they imagine. Like any experiment, the reason you do it is to learn. Who would you be without opportunity? The learnings of this experiment are gonna be on the edge of what's possible. Everybody! I can do this and it's worth doing. This became a love for us in this place. Hello, everybody. Uh, so, as Duke said, I'm Tina Roth Eisenberg. Most people know me as Swiss Miss, which is the name of my blog and my Twitter handle. And I believe in labors of love, such as the do lectures. And I went back after you invited me and looked when I first blogged about you guys. And it was in 2011. I says there, if there's one conference I dream to attend one day, it's the do lectures. I can check that one, that one off my bucket list, so I'm so, I'm so delighted to be here. So, um, as I said, I believe in labors of love, and I look at my life as my biggest design project I have, and very much so a labor of love. Uh, I was born with an intense doer gene, right from the beginning, uh, into um, the Swiss countryside with two very entrepreneurial parents, and was raised with a sense of when you do something, do it right. Um, I trained in graphic design um, and uh, studied in, in Switzerland and then in Germany and in 99 fulfilled my dream of living in New York for three months. So I moved to New York and wanted to become a graph wanted to do an internship and I've never left because I found my new home. And <clears throat> in the course of working there in various uh, uh, prestigious firms, I started a few side projects that have now sort of defined my career. And I've sort of accidentally become a business person. And some people call me the queen of accidental businesses, and I think that's quite right. So let me tell you what these side projects are. Um, so the first one is, uh, as Duke mentioned, I run a design blog called Swissmas. And I started that out of the sheer need for myself to keep track of the things I find in a visual way. Granted, this was in 2005. This was pre-Tumblr, pre-Pinterest. And um, my bookmarks were overflowing and very organized, but I just couldn't remember things to find them because it's just of their name. So I started a blog and <clears throat> very quickly realized that I'm not the only one. I'm not just blogging for myself. This is not as personal as I thought and, and sort of developed into a huge following, uh, which is quite humbling. I started a co-working space called Studio Mates. I will talk about that a little bit. I started a lecture series called Creative Mornings. I will that mention that as well. I started, I needed to, a tool to organize myself. I'm a list maker, so the, there was no tool out there that sort of fit my style, so I, I created it myself. It's called To Do. I, if any one of you is a list maker, I would love to tell you more about it. And <clears throat> I started, my, my most, most recent project is a design e temporary tattoo shop, and I will tell that story as well. So these are all the things that sort of started as side projects, never intended as businesses that have now, now defined my career. And I'm also, a wife <laughs> and the mother of two. This is my wonderful husband, Gary, who is at home now taking care of the kids and giving me the, the freedom to be here. And it, it's very clear to me that it, it wouldn't be for my kids. If it wasn't for my kids, Ella and Tilo, I wouldn't be here today. Um, they have been the biggest career catalyst for me. And at the same time also um, have made me realize how important it is to take breaks and stop working. Who we are who we are as kids? All right, so I'm pretty sure you all agree that there's no other moment in life where you really start looking at your life and where you are and how you got there than the moment you, you welcome that um, first child into your life. And <clears throat> I remember when I was pregnant with Ella, and I was always a very reflective person to begin with, but for some reason, with the hormones and the extra blood, I just went in overdrive. And I, as I got more and more pregnant, I really started thinking about where am I actually? What, you know, it's a big milestone to become pregnant and, and start a family. And I was like, wait a second, what are the dreams that I have not addressed? That, um, and one of them was running my own design studio. And I said, why didn't I do this? So for some reason, I was always waiting for that perfect moment, you know, the angelic choir that comes down and the pink boa <laughs> that says, you should start your design studio now. And I've realized that's not really happening. And <clears throat> 
I decided to start my design studio the day my daughter was born, which is not something I would recommend, <laughs> but I did. And the universe kind of gave me a head nod, and uh, right off the bat, I had this really, really prestigious museum that hired, like, that gave me a project. I was like, all right, I guess I should do this. So then I was working for about three years, and I had more clients that I could handle, and, you know, here I was, doing my dream that I always had, running my design studio. And boom, I got pregnant with Tilo, and I went into this thinking overdrive again, and I realized, you know what? That was always my dream, to have a design studio, but I think my life has changed. My dreams have changed, but I need, I need to adapt, because I really didn't want to have clients anymore. I didn't want to solve my, uh, my clients' problems. I realized that I really wanted to solve my own problems, and I realized the thing that really makes me happy was my side project. So I decided with uh, the birth of my son to go on a one-year client sabbatical. And granted, I was very lucky that I had passive income through my blog that allowed me to do that, so that's a very fortunate situation to be in. Um, so that one-year client sabbatical has been extended indefinitely. Um, about six months in, in my sabbatical, I think my husband sort of asked on um, passing, like, can you maybe never stop that sabbatical? Because I think I was just a happier person, not being on, on client deadlines and not being driven by. And um, my son is now three and a half, and my um, <coughs> sabbatical has been extended indefinitely. So I'm, I'm super fortunate, obviously. I realize that. I have two healthy kids. I have a supportive husband. I have a career that makes me absolutely happy. And then on days like this one, I wonder, how did I get from this? Because I know I was like a, a melting down kind of kid. And you know, how did I get from this um, to like what decisions have I made in life that made, you know, created this uh, fulfilling path for myself? And by the way, I'm documenting my son's meltdowns. <laughs> it's, uh, If you go to it's hardthing2.com, uh, you can see them all. Uh, <laughs> this is me outside my office. So my office is in, in downtown Brooklyn, uh, in Dumbo, Brooklyn. And this is like one of my favorite spots, just like two minutes outside my office. And, um, and I do think a lot about how did I get here? And especially now that I'm a parent, like what, what have my parents taught me? Or how did they raise me that I was able to make a lot of obviously good decisions to, you know, get to where I am. And I've realized as a parent and as an employer as well, you really need to know what you stand for. You need to know your values and not only know them, but you need to be able to articulate them. Um, and the more I, and, you know, as I said, I kind of accidentally became uh, a, a boss and, you know, all of a sudden I have a team. And I very much, and because I'm at the same time also a parent, I feel like I look at this, it's very, I, I have the same values at home that I have at work. And I think it's important that there is no distinction between that. You need to be like truthful. Do you need to be the same person? You need to live your well values. Um, and I kind of feel like, the, especially the business world, is in need of a gentle revolution. Um, I still feel like a lot of people put on a different hat when they go to work, and there's a lack of human spirit and a lack of using your heart and and leading with the heart. And and I, I I'm probably a very unusual boss. And I, I tend to I. I as authentic as I'm trying, for example, to be on my blog, I'm trying to be at work, and I'm totally okay with building vulnerable and saying I don't know, I was saying I didn't made a mistake. So, <clears throat> um, I figured I want to narrow it down my my long list of rules I live by to four core principles that I base all of my decisions on at work or at home, um, and the first one is create. So the emphasis and the importance of creating is is a big one in my life. Um, just a pure mentality of creating. And the, the other core principle I live by is to play, to never forget the importance of play, the importance of trust, and the importance of respect. And I want to give you like an example for each one of these core principles I live by. So the first one is create. Uh, I have a personal rule that if I find myself complaining about something repeatedly, I need to make a decision to either do something about it or let it go, because just complaining doesn't help anyone, right? Um, so oftentimes I end up with this one to do something about it because just that's that's just in my nature, and <clears throat> um, and there's the story of when my daughter came home in 2011 from a birthday party, and you know birthday parties kids bring home gummy goodie bags, and in there were these incredibly annoying, hideously designed, badly produced, uh, cheap temporary tattoos. And my daughter at me, asked me, hey, can you apply it? And I was like grumbling, and I was complaining about it yet again. This was like the third or fourth time. 
And uh, I reminded myself of my personal rule, and I reminded myself of my all-time favorite quote, which is by James Murphy of LCD Sound System, that the best way to complain is to make things. And um, when, when I was done applying this temperature to, that was really an insult to my Swiss aesthetic. I, um, I sat down and I started researching what would it take to manufacture tattoos. And I thought about it. Well, wait a second. You have a blog that you can market if you start this. Like You have a marketing channel. Um, I'm a user interface designer. I can make a website. Um, I have a network of people that can build it. Well, long story short is like, Boom, I, I reached out to my illustrator friends. They were so excited to design for skin, which is something I never even thought of, that they would be excited. It's like a new canvas. And two months later, I started Tatley. Uh, with, we had a mere 16 uh, designs. It was adorable. And it was like this, I did it because I just wanted my daughter to have cool designs, and I never, intend, I never expected it to, be, to turn into what it is today. Um, because on the second day, I get a call. Like, I launched, we launched it. I blogged it, and then because of the nature of my blog, uh, it, we were lucky enough to have orders right away. So we stood there next to the printer going, oh my god, look! <laughs> and then we were like, okay, let's ship this now. You know? and, and it was it was all really exciting. And then on the second day, I get a call from a really prestigious uh, museum store in London. And they asked me if they can have a wholesale catalog. And I was cool as a cucumber. I was like, sure, absolutely, no problem. Give me your address, give me your email. I hung up, and I turned around to my studio mates and goes, hey guys, what is a wholesale catalog? <laughs> So I, did, I, I called some friends who were, you know, whom had products and they got me up to speed. So we work, started working on the whole catalog. I realized, ooh, oops, I, apparently I need to do packaging as well. So we just, our learning curve was really, really steep. And I, we did packaging, we now have sets. Uh, we sell them individually wrapped like this. Um, and now I have a team of 10 people working on this, okay? Which blows my mind. And I knew nothing about selling a product. Seriously, I was a graphic, uh, I was a user interface designer. And I think it's really beautiful when people that know nothing about the industry come in and just with this enthusiasm, or as we said yesterday, grounded optimism, right? Um, and, and just fig trust that, you know, we can figure this out. And I trust my, I trusted myself, I can figure it out. And I trusted especially my team, my young, my young team. And what is interesting is when, you're, when you come in from a different industry, like you're not, I didn't hesitate to challenge certain, you know, rules that were in place. Um, and I want to tell you a few of them because I'm, uh, the more business needy, traditional business -y types, they keep um, telling me I should do things differently. And I'm like, uh, nope. Um, so for example, we pay a really way higher commission uh, for, for our artists. Um, four times as high, five times as high than what the average licensing deal gives you. And that's really important to me. It's important to me, I believe, as a creative person, that a passive income is the magic sauce to your life. Because if you create passive income that then frees you up to work on other things, you can just like, continue making without worrying about paying your rent. So it makes me really, really happy that um, some of our best-selling artists, they get really big checks every three months. And I get exclamation point email pack. And I'm, it makes me happy, right? And I don't want to change that. That is part of who we are. Uh, I want to know, as, as like in the licensing world, as a generous, um, you know, that is a generous business. And also, we support, we really push them on the site, and, and like we, the artists are being celebrated by Tatley. Then, for example, I looked into fulfillment centers and realized that um, you can, there's only so much you can control when you use a fulfillment center. And to me, it was really important that A, we can have a $5 order, because some people just can't afford a $15, $25, $30 order. Um, and I want to have stamps, real stamps. Like, I love stamps. I want to have this human touch. I want somebody to open their mailbox and go like, whoa, you know, real human at Tatley put, like, sent this to me. And so I said, nope, I'm not using the fulfillment center. We can take this in-house. I care about it. I believe that if you care about something a lot, you should not outsource it. Do it yourself so you can control the whole experience. So, and if you look at Instagram, it's amazing. So many people Instagram the envelope just because it has this human thoughtful touch. And then we, right next to me, my assistant also happens to be an amazing illustrator and calligrapher. So she writes, I mean, you write a, a, a note, if you have a gift note in there, she sits there every morning and I just watch her and my heart just goes pitter patter because she puts so much love in these little gift notes. Um, and it's just, it just makes me so happy that this is being sent out to someone. And you know, it's not just the note on, on printed on the, on the receipt. And then, for example, 
uh, made in the USA is like something I will not wear off just to make more money. Why should we outsource it? Why should we make them in the in Asia if there's an amazing if there's amazing manufacturers in the U.S. and there's so much need for jobs here? For example, I I uh, we had like um, a rush job to collate some of the sets and and I made an ad on Craigslist, and I was a little blown away at what the range of people were like. Within hours, we had like 800 applications for this collating job, and I've made a decision right there and then that I will no longer use outsource any outsource it anywhere else but have it in-house and give all these people in Brooklyn that need a job, you know, and want, I, I want to create something bigger, like t t tattoos, I'm not going to save the world, right? But, but with these little things, I feel like I can do a little something to make it a little better. And it's important to me. Um, and for example, I was approached by a really amazing book publisher that wanted to do collaborate with us. And, but that would have meant that we had to um, produce an agent. I said, I know, I'm just not going to do that. Um, and I said, why don't you make a Made in the USA line? And I, I'm still waiting for them to do that because I think it would be good for them. And then there's these little, I, I want to have in whatever we do, these little glimpses of thoughtfulness and fun and joy. It's, it's very much in David Hyatt's spirit uh, in his talk. He says he wants to do products he loves and sell them to people that love them. And that's what, for me, Tatley is all about. And I think if, if Tatley is one thing, it's, it's an amazing example of how you should never underestimate your side projects. You should take them seriously. And also, you should never shy away of challenging a status quo, in this case, the world of temporary tattoos. Um, and also, we should always be um, open to sprinkle a little nonsense into the, in the, the, the work we do. Um, I, I love Willy Wonka's quote, a little nonsense now and then was cherished, cherished by the wisest men. And this brings me to my second core principle, which is play. So a few months ago, I was invited to be a mentor for an e-commerce competition. And I was supposed to be mentoring the, the, the winners and the category of art and design. So in here, I'm sitting there with these incredibly smart young women who, within a year, have built this super successful business. That's why they uh, won that competition. And I, I'm sitting there, and I'm realizing where, very quick, quickly, they have it figured out. I mean, I was like, ooh, man, I think they're going to start soon mentoring me and not me them. So I got a little nervous. I was like, ooh, I'm not sure if I have anything to give them. And as they're telling me about, you know, about their startup, all of a sudden I realized, wait a second, there was no spark. And I asked them a simple question, and I said, are you having fun? And they looked at me, like deer in the headlights. It's like, no, we have a really hard time with that. We don't know how to do that. And I was like, oh, man, let me tell you. So I told them about our confetti drawer. Um, I feel like every business should have a confetti drawer. <laughs> it's like one of the things that makes me so happy. Um, and then I told them about um, our growth chart. Um, every employee that comes in with, is being measured and added to a growth chart. And just this growth chart makes me want to have investors. So just that if they ask me how we're doing, I can just point them to the growth chart. <laughs> uh, then we have a prop box. Which, you know, sometimes you just need to put on a Viking hat and, and it's, it's there, or a boa. Uh, I told him about the pink singing gorilla telegram that I ordered for Natalie because she worked so hard and uh, made us all laugh. Uh, or I told, told him that sometimes there's dogs walking around in a studio with hats on or monkeys are part of our meetings. And, or your lunch break might look like this because your studio mate uh, decided to organize a rainbow birthday parade. Um, and I told, I reminded them, like, just try to have fun while you're doing what you're doing. You know, life is as so serious as it is. And in, as David Ogilvy said, it, the best ideas come as jokes. Make your thinking as funny as possible. And I do believe in that. And <clears throat> it made me think about, this is my team. Um, and let me tell you, they're an amazing, amazing young group of people. And I feel so honored that they work for me. Um, and they're fun. They're total fun. <laughs> and I was thinking, after I talked to these um, uh, young women that are starting this business and, and looked to me, they were literally sitting there with their notepad, like, tell me how to have fun at work. I was like, oh. And I couldn't really explain it. And I think what it comes down to is that you need to give your, um, your employees an, an environment where they feel completely safe and trusted so they can, they can let loose. I guess that's what it is. I'm not sure. And it made me realize that. Um, I care a lot about being a good boss. I think about it all the time. And I care about my team being happy. 
if I sense that somebody's like a little off, like I, I go to, I pull them aside, like what's up? Because I, I just feel like work is, life is too short to work somewhere where you're not happy. I don't want anyone on my team that is not excited about, about where we are, and, or at least I want to hear what I could improve, right? And so I figure like for, and I realized that I think what you need to do as a boss is sort of define the responsibilities and the non-negotiables, and then leave a lot of room for, for, for them to have their own initiative and, and put their own um, ideas in, um, and just simply trust them. And I trust my team so much. Um, and I, if, if it has taught me one thing is, and granted, that was a hard lesson for me to get to this point to trust my team. I mean, I'm a user interface designer. I was like the contr biggest control flick on the planet, you know? Like every pixel had to be perfect. So I had to work my way into that, but I'm there because they're amazing. And, and if I learned one thing is that trust breeds magic. And this gets me to my third core principle uh, of trust. And as I said, I was not always like the trusting, like it took me a while to grow, grow into that. But I remember the first time where I sort of learned also to just trust my gut was um, when 9-11 happened. And I was working just a few, blo few blocks away. I was one of those people walking home wiped from head to toe. And uh, I've only been in New York for like a year and a half. And with the towers coming down, the office that I was working for shut down as well. And that meant I lost my visa, um, and all the signs were pointing to, Tina, you need to move back to Switzerland. And I remember I had this moment of like, uh-uh. Like my gut was telling me, like, you cannot move back. Your chapter of New York is not over. You need to just like trust that this will work out. And it was rough, but I realized that I needed to channel my inner Bill Cosby and decide that I wanted it more than I was afraid of it. And, <clears throat> and I, I, f I feel like this quote applies to so many parts of our life, right? That there's these moments where we're afraid of something and then you just need to kind of work up the trust and courage and convince yourself. Because every time I, uh, whenever I put a trust in myself and in the people around me, um, my, my life has expanded many folds. And it's very much the quote of Anna Yisnin, life shrinks or expands in proportion to one's courage. And one of the examples around that, um, one of my favorite examples for trust, my, my uh, prin principle is when I started my, my lecture series uh, called Creative Mornings. So in 2008, I uh, have been going to a lot of conferences and I realized that in the end of the day, the reason why we go to conferences is because we want to meet people and exchange ideas and make connections. And I realized that conferences are very expensive, very elitist, very time consuming. And I've gotten a lot of emails because I will come back from these conferences, I would write about them on my blog, and I will get really heartfelt emails from young designers who say, like, you know, I'm just so envious that you get to see my hero speak, and I can go, and my boss doesn't send me, it's too expensive, blah, blah, blah. So I realized, you know, there needs to be something accessible that is completely um, democratic, where we can go once a month and meet our creative community in our, in our, in our city. So I, I started Creative Mornings with that idea in mind, and I figured, you know, I have a design studio, I can just open my doors. And I started in 2008, and then very quickly, uh, more, or just, this was like a meet at the apartment in Soho, they, they hosted this a few times, and other design studios opened the doors, which is exciting to begin with, to see other environments. And uh, it grew, and we're in an indoor park, and, and, and it was pretty amazing to see how this just like took a life on its own, and it was still just in New York. And it made me realize that I hit a nerve, and, and I think Clay Shirky says it right, um, in that we systematically overestimate the value of access to information and underestimate the value of access to each other. And I think that's what the beauty of Creative Mornings is, because you don't, you don't make real connection behind, connections behind the screen. In the end of the day, you make them uh, in person. So now we've grown to the place where we fill a metro, this was at the Metropolitan Museum with George Lois, um, and we filled this up in like a few minutes, like when RSVP opens. Um, it's, 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 it's humbling. And so we were, I was doing this for two years in New York, and I'm getting to the trust part now. Um, and then uh, two years later, uh, my friend Danielle in Zurich emailed me and says, like, Tina, Tina, I want to do this in Zurich. Again, control freak Tina, right? It's like, oh, like I need to trust him. Like, what if he screws up? You know, what, what if he doesn't do it right? What if he doesn't translate the spirit that is so important to me? And, and I had an, 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 a little bit of inner turmoil, and I realized, you know, you have to be courageous, you have to trust. This is, you know, and I let him do it. And a month later, my friend, who used to live in, in New York, um, moved to, uh, to LA, and he has attended many, many creative mornings. So he, I knew that he gets it, gets it. So 
So he, I was like, okay, John, yeah, I can be, I can open, be open-minded. And the next thing you know is that I get inquiries from around the world. And we're in 59 cities now. And I must say, every month when I see, so we have a theme every month that the hosts in the respective cities um, pick a speaker that represents their city in this global conversation on that topic in, in relation to creativity. And every month when I see these photos roll in, so this is Orlando, Budapest, Chicago, Los Angeles, Berlin, Milan, Utrecht, just to give you Auckland, New Zealand, uh, Zurich, Seattle, San Francisco. I always get a little emotional when I see these photos. Because in the end of the day, I just started this never thinking of anything big, just in my studio. And just by letting go and trusting these hosts, this has become something so much bigger, something so much magic, so magical. And they've all completely over-delivered. This is the amazing thing. So they're not paid. Nobody's paid. This is volunteer. They all believe in this is something good for their community. And, and I feel like Creative Mornings is, a, is in the perfect example of how trust breeds magic. And by everyone just believing in something bigger. And we just launched um, two weeks ago and this is really when I thought this is the highlight of my career. And uh, I got really emotional when we launched this site because now we have, this was a Kickstarter funded um, project. So, because Creative Mornings is free and all of these attendees around the world said, yes, we want to have an, uh, an archive for all of the videos. So now we have a site where uh, all of the talks are online. Um, so every month there's another 59 talks going up on a certain topic. But the thing that really gets me excited is this. <coughs> So we only launched two weeks ago, and there's three, over 3,000 profiles of real people, creatives in their cities that attend these things. They've filled out a little um, biography, and then, like, you, there's a tangible network now of like in your city. You can look them up, and the best part is, you see that checkbox up here. Checkbox here. You can uh, you can check by single. So. Um, and what I've learned is like trust is the greatest compliment of all. It really is. And uh, Blaine Lee has a beautiful quote and um, it says, when people honor each other, there's a trust established that leads to synergy, interdependence, and deep respect. Both parties make decisions and choices based on what's right, what is best, what is valued most highly. <clears throat> and that brings me to my fourth principle, is respect. Um, I feel like our, our work, our work in my environment has been um, dehumanized quite a bit through technology. And I see the pen pendulum swinging back. Um, not, not that there's anything wrong with working from home and, and, and all that. And, you know, like for a while, everybody thought nobody has ever go to an office again. You know, we can be Skyping and all that. And I've done that for a while, but I've realized that uh, I was miserable. I started my studio from home. I was incredibly isolated, and granted, I was online all the time with all these people I'm working with, and I was just, like, it was so sucking to me, and I realized I just need, I need the human environment, I need the people that inspire me that I can have interesting conversations with, and I, I uh, rented a few desks in, 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 in offices where they rented desks out, and I realized, well, they're not doing it for the reasons that I would want to have a co-working space, and I got my own space. So in 2008, I had this vision for uh, a space with equally entrepreneurial, excited, creative people like me and that we can hang out and, you know, and work on our own projects. And what, what started out as a four-people space in, in Dumbo, right on the East River, it's really cool. Actually, by the way, I'm office neighbors with Steve, where he now? We had to come to California to meet here. He's on the ninth floor, I'm on the sixth floor. Um, so, uh, what started out in this one room, and again, I, I never expected it to turn into what it turned into, is we're now over 50 people. We've been breaking down walls, and if you look at who's in our space, if you go to studiomates.com, it is amazing. It's like my mini do lectures every day. Um, and we have lunches together. Oh, hold on. We have lunches together, we play together, we collaborate together. It just automatically happens when you have like the best 
when you have an amazing photographer sitting next to you, or a developer, or uh, an illustrator, and, you know, and you're working on a project, and you can just turn around, it's like, Julia, do you, can you shoot this for me? It's just beautiful, and also the conversations are so interesting over lunch. But most of all, what I've never expected would happen is like the support that I got out of my studio mates and the tremendous respect that is happening in there. Like the respect that, that everyone has for each other's craft, each other's individuality, um, that has really, has really touched me. And it's hard to explain. You need to come in and you need to experience it. But it brings me to a quote from Seth Godin. Who you hang out with determines what you dream about and what you collide with, and the collisions and the dreams lead to your changes, and the changes are what you become. Change the outcome by changing your circle. And I know for a fact that Studio Mates has, um, has changed my circle. I would not have started Tatley, I would not have not gone on a sabbatical if it wasn't for this, like, this respect and this trust that people gave me, or just trust in myself and the support system that I had at my studio. So. I poured my heart into creating a work environment that I now call my happy place, which is a small community of smart people, uh, my own little daily do lectures. Um, I created um, my blog just as a visual archive for myself, which has become a very public archive, and a challenge for me to also, because the audience has gotten so big, to not sell out, because it was very tempting at times, and, and just really stay true to myself and like challenge myself to, like you know, um, yeah, just to be authentic. Um, I started Tatley, and, and has, it has taught me a lesson on never shying away of changing, uh, challenging a status quo, and, and also I'm believing you can change how things are done in, in, in some sense in a greater good. And then um, Creative Mornings is just the biggest example of if, if, if people believe in something big, something really, really big and magical can happen, and it's not money-driven. You know, it doesn't, the money doesn't always come first. And uh, the amazing thing is that we've gotten now so big, such an undeniable force in the creative industry, that now the big brands want to associate themselves with us, which is just amazing, right? So all of these four things are labors of love um, that never intended as businesses, that I've done from the heart, and the money came afterwards uh, accidentally. And I'm, I'm, they're not making me rich, but I'm, I have an incredibly rich life. I have a life that fulfills me that I, I mean, I'm here today, here. It's amazing, right? It's a, it's, it's a blessing. And, and what I, I, all of this has taught me one thing, and I will try to teach my children is, and this is my closing quote by Scott Belsky, that a labor of love always pays off. That's it. <laughs>